Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk about my accident and what happened. Let's travel back in the past, eight years ago, in 2013. Back then I was 17 years old. I was a pretty happy girl. I mean, I changed school, I was at a new school, uh, I found great friends, I liked subjects. I didn't put a lot of effort into school, but I still managed to get good grades. So, in general, I was happy with my school life, friend life and that. Uh, what about boys? I mean, I was 17 years old. I had previous boyfriends, but they broke my heart so hard that I decided that I don't want to have anything to do with boys anymore. So back then I also found a new hobby, which was paragliding. The first time I flew was back in 2010, I flew with my uncle and I enjoyed it so much that I decided that I will do this as well. And here in Italy you can start flying at the age of 16. So I was 17, I was actually 16 when I started. And um, yeah, it was great. It was summer. Summer 2013. I didn't work because I wanted to put all my time into flying. So I basically flew every single day. This was like my life, it made me happy. For me it was really like I finally found something that made me happy. I felt complete. It was just the one thing I was looking for. Back then a normal day looked like this. I woke up at 7.50 right when my mom left for work, so that she wasn't able to tell me, you know, Lisa, today do this, do that, and do that, and that. No. I woke up when she left, so I was able to do whatever I wanted during the day, at least until lunch. <laughs> at like, uh, I think around nine, I met my uncle at the cable car, and we used to go up to the mountain. Uh, we prepared, and we just flew. We had this very short flight of 10-15 minutes, just because it was in the morning, and the wind is very calm. The, the flights themselves are very calm. It was exactly what I wanted. I used to fly in the morning, like I did one or two flights, and sometimes also at night. It depended on the weather, obviously. I mean, I wasn't able to fly every day, but I tried as much as I was able. Let's go back to the 25th of July 2013. It was uh, pretty much the same day as all the other ones, I woke up at 7.15, my mom left, I had breakfast, I put on my leggings and a blue t-shirt with an ice cream. I know this because yesterday I read through my uh, diary just to, you know, get some last nice inputs on what happened. Uh, <laughs> so I met my... Oh no, I didn't meet my uncle at the cable car. We went together to the cable car. He was actually flying with another woman. She was French. And so we took the cable car, we went up to the mountain. Obviously then you have to have a look at the wind from where it comes, how strong it is, and you have to uh, choose the perfect starting location. We chose one, one we use very often. But this day was a little different. Let me tell you, there are two techniques, I know, uh, of how you can start with a paraglider. First of all, you always have to unfold the paraglider, like you have this huge backpack that weighs like around 15 kilos, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, it depends. And you basically take out your paraglider, you unwrap it, unfold it, and then you have to check all the cords, if there are knots, if they are right, stuff like that. As soon as you're done, you have to hang yourself into the paraglider, and you're basically facing the direction you want to go. So basically, what you have to do is you have to go against the wind. So you hang yourself to your paraglider, the paraglider itself is behind you, you are looking to the front. You take the cords in your hands, you run, and the paraglider will come up from behind. As soon as it is above your head, you have to break it down, like, so that it doesn't fly over you. You have a last look up to see, okay, are the cords all right? You know, this is just very, very last uh, look at it. And if everything is all right, you just run and you take off. You can't really use this method everywhere. Like when you're on a higher mountain with a lot of wind, let's say this method is not really secure because as soon as the paraglider is above you and you have the last look at the cords to see, hey, does everything seem all right? You might as well have already taken off, which is not what you want because what if in the last minute you see, hey, wait, there's something wrong with the cords 
and you're already in the air, so that's not an option. In this case, there is a different approach to starting. Uh, you basically unfold the paraglider, always the same stuff, you check your cords, you hang yourself into the paraglider, but instead of facing the direction you want to go, you turn yourself around, so that you do something with the cords, you turn around and are basically facing the paraglider. So the direction you want to run is behind you. What do you do? You take the cords with one hand, with the other hand you just hold the brake and you pull the cords. The paraglider will come up and you have a lot of time to check, hey, is everything all right, you know, the whole time while the paraglider goes up. Not like in uh, the first option where you can check the cords as soon as the paraglider is above you because it comes from the back. No, in this case you have to, uh, you can check the cords from the moment the paraglider like takes off from the ground. Which is great. In this case, if you see, hey, wait, there's something wrong, you can immediately stop it and uh, put the paraglider back down to the ground. You have a lot of control in this case. So, what happens? When you, <laughs> when you pull the cords and the paraglider comes up, you see, okay, everything is alright. As soon as the paraglider is basically above you, you turn around and run in the direction you want to run, okay? That's the thing. Two methods. So from where I started, I usually um, use the second method, just for a simple reason that the mountain is like very high, it's approximately 2500 meters and the wind is pretty strong. Like you need all the control you can have of your paradigm. That's it. So on that day, on the 25th of July 2013, when I was up there, the wind was very, very calm, and so we were not able to use this second method, because why not? The thing is, when you uh, pull the paraglider up and it's above you, and you turn around, until you finish turning around, the paraglider is again on the ground, just because there is not enough wind if it's too calm. So we were not able to use this second method. We had to use the first one, which is actually not my preferred one. <laughs> but anyway, so my uncle took off in front of me here and uh, this French woman and I was right behind him, I was ready to run, ready to take off and I ran, my paraglider came up but it flew like in front of me, I forgot to break it or something, I have no idea, honestly, no idea. Um, so okay, it was on the floor, again I had to take the paraglider, unfold it, check again all the cords, um, do everything once again and I was again there and said, okay Lisa, Let's try again. You can do this this time. Okay, so we basically, we, I, <laughs> I basically ran once again and I was determined to finally take off. But again, the same thing happened. I think the paraglider wasn't really above my head but on one or the other side and so it's a little impossible to basically take off. <laughs> so the paraglider was again on the floor and at this point I was already a little bit... Um, like I was not at the starting point up there because I ran once and then a second time. So in this case I decided, okay, let's take the whole paragraph, let's go up to the top and let's do this all for the third time. Let's do this again, we will do this. So again, I prepared the paraglider, the cords, everything looked perfect. Uh, I was ready to take off and I was there. I thought, Lisa, you have to do this, you can do this, you're not bad at flying. You enjoy it so much and I really wanted to, you know, do something out of myself. I wanted to be good at this, to uh, take part at competitions. But if you're not even able to start, then how is this going to work? I focused on what was in front of me. I took a deep breath and I started running. And finally, finally I was able to take off. I was so happy. So I was in the air and I was like, yeah! celebrating. <laughs> it was amazing. You have to know that I used to think I believe I can fly every time I was in the air. It was just so peaceful, it was beautiful, amazing and nobody was able to hear me, which is the most important thing. <laughs> anyway, I was up there and I immediately noticed that I was losing height very very fast, which can be a little problem because you have to know the mountain is basically like this, okay? In winter we have ski slopes here. So I, and it's pretty long, and the town itself is down here. So I had to start and fly over this mountain and then down 
to the town. And the problem is, if I'm losing too much height, I'm not able to get over the edge of this mountain, you know, I have to land before I get over the edge, which is a huge problem. Because first of all, there are many trees. And second of all, you can start from there. Like, obviously because of the trees and also because of the how it is situated, like the wind is probably coming from the back, which is not good. And the third thing is that if you land there, there's only one possibility. You have to go back up to the mountain, which would take me probably, I thought about it, probably about an hour, which is a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> Uh, especially with 15 kilos on your back and I didn't want that. So I wasn't even able to finish the thought that all at once the left side of my paraglider folded into itself and in this case I'm sure that there are possibilities of how you can solve this but I was so shocked that I didn't know what to do. I wasn't ready for this and I was just there like what am I going to do now? You have to know that when you fly with a paraglider you have a vario with you which is a device that tells you if you're losing or gaining height. This is very important because obviously when you're flying with a paraglider you want to have a long flight then you have to find like uh, thermal lifts and it's really hard to tell if you're like gaining or losing uh, height at that point so you have this device that tells you. You can see on the display yeah you're losing uh, height you're gaining height I don't know and it also makes a sound like do, do, do. when you're gaining it, do, 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 do. it depends, it goes higher and um, faster if you're gaining a lot of height, like in the shortest time. And in that, uh, in that moment where I was, like where my paraglider folded itself, I was obviously losing height and my vario went like, do, <laughs> and I sounded this bit that I was losing 12 um, meters per second. I was basically going towards the ground. And the thing I knew in that moment was that I was going to hurt myself. I was going to hurt myself very, very bad. I didn't know it was going to be that bad, but I knew that I was going to hurt myself. I basically crashed down on the ground and the first thing I felt was this pain. It was the, the worst pain I ever felt in my entire life. It was the first and only time I felt a pain uh, of 10 out of 10, probably. I was basically down there, I was uh, still in the seat of my paraglider. <laughs> the paraglider has like an airbag under the seat, but it's not something that like explodes like in a car. It's more like as soon as you start flying, it fills with air and it can like make the landing a little bit more comfortable if you're not able to land on your feet, but obviously it was not able to help me in this case. I was just crashing down so hard and I was lying on the left side basically. I was still in the chair and I was on the on the grass. I was like lying on this side and the pain was huge. Obviously what do I do? I was screaming. I was screaming. It was it was killing me. Uh, obviously there were not many people around, some tourists but they were too far away. And so I realized okay this is not going to help me. Uh, I wanted to stand up and see what's going on, where my pain comes from. But then I realized, hey, I'm not able to stand up. I took my hand and I touched my thigh and I was not able to feel it. It felt literally like I was touching the leg of a different person. It felt literally like that. Like nowadays I feel my upper leg again so I can't really imagine it, but let me tell you, it was exactly like when you have a person right next to you, you touch their leg, this was the feeling, but it was my leg. And then I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Obviously, but then I didn't know what like a spinal cord injury is. I didn't know anything at all. Not about these things here. And so <laughs> I honestly didn't know, hey, what can I do now? So first thing I called my uncle because I was so lucky that my phone was in my right pocket and I was able to reach it because basically my left arm and my left hand was under my body and obviously I wasn't able to move. I mean the pain and my legs didn't work. 
everything was a little strange. So I was very, very happy that I was able to uh, grab my phone and I called my uncle. Obviously he was still in the air, so I was not really able to call him. I called him, but he didn't answer. And so I called um, the number of the guys that do like the tandems with paragliders. Because, I mean, we met them just before. And so I called and one answered and I said, Hey, look, I just crashed down. I can't feel my legs. What, what am I supposed to do now? And he was there and said, Okay, Lisa, I will immediately send you somebody. So he called the helicopter and he said, Lisa, you will have to wait a moment, but they will come immediately. So, okay, I was there. I was dying. The view was actually fantastic. The view was 10 out of 10. <laughs> the view and the pain, 10 out of 10. Then I got a call, it was my uncle, and I told him briefly what happened. That's it, I can't really remember what we talked about. Anyway, um, I just told him that the helicopter is already on its way, and then I was there again, alone. Then I got another call, and I was there like, what is going on now? <sighs> I didn't like uh, getting calls back then, I, like, I was a texting person. And I saw that it was my dad. You have to know that my dad and my uh, mother, they separated in 2011, so two years early. I love my dad, but we don't have like daily contact. <laughs> and it was a little strange that he was calling me in the morning. And I was like, okay, oh, let's pick up. And I said, hey. And he was like, oh, Lisa, hey, oh, oh my God, I'm so happy that I... That, that you're answering. A friend of mine just saw a paraglider crashing down and uh, he thought that it was you. Oh my god, I'm so happy, I'm so glad that it is not you, that you are right. Yeah. Then imagine me and my father there so happy about it and me on the floor in pain and not able to move anymore, not able to feel my legs and then I was there and I had to tell him, yeah, that. It was me, I crashed down, I am here on the floor, I have so much pain, I don't know what's going on, I, I, I really can't feel my legs, I can't move my legs, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I, I just felt so bad, not, not even for me, but for him, because I mean, I didn't want anyone else to feel bad for me. You may think, okay Lisa, why didn't you call your parents immediately? As I said, uh, my father, I don't have daily contact with him and I actually thought he was at work, I think, I don't know. And my mom, I'm afraid of her. I was so afraid of her. Like, I respected her so much and um, well, she's able to get angry at me. Like, very angry. If I can tell you the truth nowadays, if she gets angry with me when I am 24 years old, it still happens that I am crying. I'm just mm, a little afraid of her. <laughs> She's cool and all, but yeah, let's go back. And so I finished my call with my dad. It broke my heart, obviously. And uh, there is like a um, restaurant right next to where I crashed down. And the owners of it, Markus and Brigitte, they came to me. They comforted me. They were like there for me. And other people came uh, that wanted to go paragliding, they waited with me, and then the helicopter came. The helicopter came, the doctor came out, and um, I don't really know what happened. Like, obviously they put me into the helicopter, and I was happy that I was finally able to fly with the helicopter. It was my first flight with a helicopter. <laughs> and she said, the doctor said, hey, do you want something against the pain? And I was there like, no, 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 thank you. Just because my mom always told me that, yeah, I mean, pain medication is not so healthy. You shouldn't take it. Obviously, you shouldn't take it excessively. But in this case, where I had the pain 10 out of 10, I could have taken it. <laughs> anyway, we uh, took off with the helicopter and then I was there, like, please give me something against the pain. I got something. Something very strong, actually. I can't really remember everything. Um, now we come at that point where, like, my memories are fading a little bit. I remember how we landed at the hospital in the city and I was able to see the hills uh, in the vicinity. So as soon as we landed, people were running towards us and they put me in a stretcher and they ran with me towards the hospital. Then, I don't know what was going on. I can remember that I was in a room. Uh, I was um, still on the stretcher, I think, and they were basically 
cutting off my clothes. They can't really remove your clothes normally for a simple reason that they should not move you at all. Because whatever your injury is, it could get worse if they move you around. So they cut out my t-shirt, my leggings, uh, they removed my makeup, I mean also I'm wearing a little bit of mascara. Um, they removed my earrings, everything I was wearing. And they were also cutting my underwear and I was like, no, no, don't do this. I was uh, ashamed of myself back then. I didn't want people to see me naked. I mean, it's a job they have seen. I don't know how many naked people and it's not like the problem. It's not that they were like, oh my god, she's naked. No. I mean, I should have had other problems than, oh my god, they're seeing me naked. The next thing I remember is that I was in a room. Uh, the nurse came and she said, yeah, your mom is here now. Can she come and see you? And I was like, no, 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 no. No, I was terrified. I didn't want her to see me um, because I was afraid that she would be angry at me, that she would yell at me. I don't know. So the nurse said, okay, Elisa, I, I will talk to your mom. Uh, time passed and uh, then they said, Lisa, you are going to the surgery now. We will take you and before we go in, your mom and your dad and your family wants to see you. I was like, mm, I don't want to, but okay. And we left the room and there they were. My mom, my dad, my uncle and my aunt. And they had all tears in their eyes, they were crying. It was the second time I saw my mom crying. The first time she cried was when I was still in kindergarten. And one day my brother was not able to walk anymore, like he had something with his brain that wasn't working. And back then, and she was crying there. And this is the second time in my life where I saw her crying. And um, my dad, my dad was there and he was also crying. And this was basically so, so sad. Like, you know, the people you love, you don't want to make them cry. You don't want to make them go through something like this. My uncle was also crying. And I mean, my uncle is like, He's you know, very strong and hmm, like he always seems like he doesn't have feelings but he was crying there and seeing all the people that are so important to me around me crying made me realize what I did like it was something really really bad I felt so bad obviously before I did the MRI stuff like that and let me tell you the MRI was like the most beautiful thing I've ever done they made the MRI of my whole body, which probably took a long, long time. And imagine me being in so much pain. I have no idea what they gave me, but it was so strong. I was in there, in the machine, laying there and just enjoying my life. It was amazing. It was just beautiful. <laughs> After the surgery, I was in a room. I got a very small room. It literally, it had a sink, my bed and a little window. And the only thing I was able to see out of the window was... Another building, so basically nothing. And I also had the door. From the door I was able to see the corridor. It was white, it was it looked like just like a hospital. I have to know that this building is a little bit older, so it was not really a nice place to be. And the only thing that I saw there was the clock and it made a noise each time. It changed the time. That's all I can remember. And I know that there was a woman in another room. Uh, and she was screaming at night, so she was often screaming. And I was actually in the only uh, single room they had. It's a very small one. Uh, I would never want to go back there ever again. My mom sat there that night on a chair with me. She didn't want to leave me alone. My grandma told me that after surgery, I told her that I was not afraid of the surgery. Everything went well. I told my uncle, yeah, we'll see each other tomorrow at night at the cable car. <laughs> Very optimistic, yeah. Obviously it didn't happen. And um, yeah, I was basically there. I had a lot of pain. Uh, the problem was that I was basically still not able to feel my legs, not able to move them. But within the first days, I slowly got back a little bit of strength of my upper legs. But like it went so, so slowly. When I was laying, can I show you? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I was like laying like this and 
was I able to keep my legs like this? I think I was. But they were constantly falling to one or the other side. Yes. So as you can see, I can move, yes, but can you see my beautiful legs? I don't have any muscles working down here, like nothing at all. But also the upper part is just working a little bit. Anyway, let's go back. And don't mind my red socks. The first days in hospital, they were very hard for me. I had a lot of family and friends uh, coming to visit me. Obviously, I was so happy to see them. Um, I hate uh, being there, but uh, at that point, I was still very optimistic. I thought, okay, I hurt myself, I had a surgery, everything will turn out fine in the end. Um, I was there for, for the first five days. I got a lot of pain medication. Um, my grandma made me eat everything I got to eat. I mean, it's a grandma. Grandmas always want you to eat. <laughs> and I was there for five days. Um, it was very depressing, actually. Um, yeah, friends came by. And there's another guy who was with me in class, like, maybe five, year, five, six years earlier. And I haven't heard of him since. And he was, like, the first person that was not family to come visit me. He was so nice! We just talked for such a long time. <laughs> so, after five days on the... 30th of July, I got moved to the rehabilitation station and I went into a new room. The room was actually very nice. Uh, I got big windows, I had uh, finally a view, but there was someone else with me in the room. And I was still a little sad, like I just wanted to go home. I didn't want to stay in hospital after five days, yeah. <laughs> And I started physiotherapy. I remember, uh, well, in this station, it's like full of rooms. And at the end of the corridor, there are like the rooms for the physiotherapy. So uh, the physiotherapist came to me. My physiotherapist was Marika. She was very, very nice. <laughs> and so optimistic always. Always smiling. She was just great. And she also had, like she in general, the, this part of the hospital had two trainees. And they were helping her out. They were actually both young and very good looking. At least something positive for me. <laughs> so on the first day of my physiotherapy, I had to sit on the wheelchair and they basically had to bring me to the room where we would do all the exercises and stuff. As soon as they put me on the wheelchair, which was the hardest thing ever, in general it was the first time in five days that I sat up. Uh, the corridor was not so long, but as soon as we reached the room, I was like seeing black. It was horrible. But then they put me down and I calmed down and we just started off with very, very simple things. Obviously, you always have to keep in mind that I just had a surgery. Um, they still, they can't really say, hey, how are you evolving? It was too early in the first two months, so much can still happen. So basically I was there, I had physiotherapy and stuff like that. Back then my aunt brought me a lot of books from Nicholas Sparks. I loved reading them. And yeah, I just spent my time doing physiotherapy, laying in bed. I had a lot of uh, visitors I liked to read. And I remember I was on Instagram, I had some friends posting pictures of them being, I don't know, going hiking and stuff like that. And I was so jealous. I really wanted to be there as well. I thought, I don't want to be here anymore. Let me go out there. I want to go with them. I want to discover the world. I don't want to be here. One day, I just finished physiotherapy and I was going back to my room. I was actually pretty happy and satisfied with myself because I made a progress on a daily basis. Like very, very tiny little steps. But it was always something. As soon as I reached my room, my mom was there and she was crying, which was actually pretty strange because usually my parents came at night, like after I finished my physiotherapy, uh, when I was free, you know. But she was there and she was crying and I was there like, Mom, what's going on? What is it? And she was there like, and she told me, yeah, I just spoke to the doctor and he said, Lisa, you will never walk again. <sighs> this was a very bad moment for me. I mean, she took me by surprise because I didn't expect this. I saw the progress we did every day. 
and um, also on a daily basis I was able to feel a little bit more and more of my legs and the strength started coming back. I was so optimistic and then she told me this and this was horrible to hear for me. I mean you have to know that my mom, um, she's a very strong person but not when we're talking about my health. Like in all these years every time there is something going on with my health she feels bad like she's not able to be so strong like I have to be the strong one I have to tell her hey mom everything is gonna be okay I have to be the strong one here and I had to be the strong person starting from that moment at night I was in bed, I was actually reading a book of Nicholas Sparks and I was almost at the end. There was also a woman who had an accident and something very horrible happened to that woman but in the end everything turned out okay and I was not able to finish the book. It was horrible, I just wanted to throw it out of the window, you know. All these happy endings, obviously in Nicholas Sparks books it's a whole happy ending. I felt devastated. I wanted to die, literally. I, I didn't want to be there anymore. Uh, this is too much for me to handle. I was just in bed crying and crying and the woman who um, shared the room with me, she had some visitors and they felt bad for me. And then the doctor came and one of the doctors, she sat there with me and I don't know what she told me. I was just there like, please leave me all alone. I, I don't want to be here. I can't do this anymore. I can't. I mean, at that point I still wanted to go home, to get my old life back, to go to school! I wanted to go to school! Because sc school started in the meantime, you know. I wanted to go to school, I wanted to go hike, uh, go out with my friends, just do funny things. And I was not able, I was there in hospital, I was trying to get some progress on a daily basis. My life just changed from one day to the other one. So obviously, as they told me, Lisa, you'll never walk again, means that I will be in a wheelchair. And in order to be in a wheelchair, it's not like that you sit in a wheelchair and that's it. No, it's a little bit more complicated. We live in a world that's not really accessible for everyone, especially here in Europe, like we have these old cities. And it's hard to get uh, to many places. You have to learn how to handle the wheelchair, you know. If there is an obstacle, how you can... Um, defeated i don't know like you have to learn so many things and so the doctors told me lisa uh, we would suggest to you to go to a rehabilitation station is this even a word i don't know <laughs> in austria uh, they are specialized on spinal cord injuries and they will help you so much and it's such a beautiful place stuff like that blah 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 i didn't want to know anything about it i was there like no 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 i'm here since months i want to go home i want to go home i want to be there I don't want to be different than all the other ones. I don't want to have to fight just to have a normal life. I'm just gonna go back in the past and just sleep the whole 25th of July 2013. Never go and fly. Obviously, that's not possible. So, in the end, I basically had to go. I mean, I was 17 years old and everyone just wanted the best for me. So I said, okay, let's go. So from July until November, it was the 12th of November, I was in the hospital here in the city. And then the day after I went to Austria to this beautiful, beautiful rehabilitation, rehabilitation station. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, to that place, it's called Bad Hering. And it's beautiful. Like it's on a hill. It's on a little, in a little town. And it's on a hill. It's so modern so huge, it's beautiful. Um, obviously back then I didn't like it because I was not happy with myself. I was not happy in my situation. All I wanted was the normal life, being normal and that's all. I didn't want to go there, have physiotherapy on a daily basis, I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to meet people in the wheelchairs, you know. I didn't want to do anything with these people. Uh, but I have to tell you that the place itself, it, it's modern, huge, it's great, you have so many possibilities. The people there, they are so nice. The team itself, they are young and full of energy and so optimistic and so funny and the place is just amazing. But I was not happy. I was not happy because I was not happy with myself. 
And I know it now because um, last year, no, in 2019, in December, I was there again for a month because of other problems. And it was, I think, the best time ever. Like, whew, it's a great place. And they helped me, obviously, so much. So I was there. I had a uh, roommate. She was like two years younger than me. She was also in a wheelchair, but she had like um, more problems. That, In my case, it was like this. I was able to move my legs and in addition I was able to walk a little bit just a little bit and only with the crutches and with some other help and obviously I was different than the other one and my physiotherapist the one I had there uh, his name is Lucas he was great he was very great um, he told me once that it, it, it is very hard for people in my situation because we are not really tied to the wheelchair, you know, 100% like the other people, but we can also not walk normally. So we are like in between. We want to be like normal people, but we are not. And we can't, we, we don't really want to be like the people in the wheelchair. We try to keep our distance. And he is so right, because that, that was me. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to meet all these people, although they were so nice. And we had such a great time, generally. I was just not really happy and uh, anyway long story short if you want to know more about it I can obviously tell you but um, <laughs> I mean this video is already so long so basically afterwards on the 24th of January I went to Kitzbühel to see the ski race it was amazing we went to the VIP tent and stuff like that it was huge amazing and on the 25th of January 2014 like it was exactly half a year after my accident I went home again I went home not forever but I went home to stay at home so yeah I was obviously happy, uh, I was somehow happy, not that much, because obviously I didn't uh, make the, all the progress I wanted, because as time went by, the progress became smaller and smaller and smaller, and in the end it was really, you weren't able to see any progress, especially not me, because I mean, I am myself, maybe people that saw me once a month, they were able to see something, but not me. So I went back home, only one friend knew that I was going back to school, and so, surprise, I'm back! <laughs> I was happy that it was still hard and uh, like I was not qualified in any of the subjects for the first semester. I mean, obviously dance in at the beginning of February. So I had to study everything they did in the past months while keeping up with them, which was great. No, at least I had something to do. Obviously, uh, I still had physiotherapy a few times a week. I had a lot to do and in the end, at the end of the school year, I passed all the subjects, uh, obviously they closed one eye, if not both, <laughs> and I went back once again to Bad Hering to do some more physiotherapy. I didn't like it that time either. It was a little strange for me. It was a strange situation for me. It's a little bit more complicated now. Um, it's just because I had like sort of a boyfriend, but he was not really okay with me not being able to walk, like he was there like, yeah Lisa, we will be like together for real as soon as you can walk again, like he was focused on me being able to walk again one day, which was obviously not the case, and so as I went back there I felt even worse than the first time. And yeah, that's it. Afterwards I came back home again, I finished school, I started university, I still had physiotherapy, I did a lot of for myself as well. I mean obviously I was not able to run or do I don't know what but in general I was really satisfied with what I, what I was able to do and yeah I was definitely not 100% happy because I was not able to accept my situation um, in general you know I didn't want to be who I am I never felt good enough for other people I always felt like other people were judging me and let's say my last boyfriend, he really helped me overcome this. Like he showed me how beautiful life can be and what I can do. And since I was together with him, like I see life in such a different way. This is also why I'm here now. I could never have been able to talk to people freely like this. And now I'm here and I'm so happy I finally, I'm finally accepting who I am. And I mean, I have my disability. I can walk sometimes, sometimes not. 
um, they can live life and I'm happy. And I have a lot of dreams and I will achieve them one day or the other one. <laughs> Trust me, my dream is not to run a marathon. My dreams are like achievable for me, so don't worry. <laughs> and yes, um, this is basically it. Obviously, doctors told me I will never be, I would never be able to walk again. But I am somehow, obviously not normally, not one hundred percent. I had my ups and downs, especially two thousand nineteen was a big down. In general, like up and downs, we all have them, and we just have to deal with our lives. And this experience was probably not the best one I had in life, but it changed me in so many ways and also in so many positive ways. And I'm happy where I am at the moment. And I'm really, really looking forward to the future. I'm trying to be a better version of myself every single day while being happy, which I am. So thank you so much for being here and see you next time. Bye bye.